in case, in case I say anything wrong, he's got uh, a weapon. <laughs> Welcome everybody this morning. We're so glad that you're with us. It's a joyful, joyful morning. We have, uh, we have another baptism today. We're always so excited by that. Welcome to our visitors this morning. Those of you who are watching us remotely, some even from Florida, we're glad to have you with us as well. It is a very fearful thing to stand before the Lord's people and, and talk about the scriptures. It's a very uh, it's a fearful responsibility, but it's a joyful one. So if you'll permit me just a moment, I, wanted, I want us to turn to John chapter 6. If you have your Bibles with you, turn in those. If you don't, you've got one in, in your phone. I know you do. So turn with me to John chapter 6. This is very well-known scripture to all of us. This shouldn't be anything new. Uh, but revisiting, revisiting the, the old truths is important to do on a frequent basis. Amen? Uh, we know the scripture really well, but what I, want to, what I want to remind us of is how important it is to read the whole thing, to read the scripture in its entirety, not just a piece of it. Uh, a wise old preacher once said that a text without a context is a pretext. That means it's a pretext for heresy. And if you, if you read just pieces of a, of a chapter like this, you can head cross-country towards heresy pretty fast, right? So the example is in, found in verse 37. This is, just a, this is just very brief. All that the Father giveth to me shall come unto me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. And that's where a lot of people stop. And that's where we get into trouble. Taking a verse like that and, and taking it out of context and not reading the rest of the chapter is very, very dangerous. It will take us very quickly to, to uh, remove, taking glory away from the Lord and giving it to men and into other, other heresies. And we could, spend, we could spend weeks preaching on that subject. But it says, all the Father that give to me shall come to me, and, and then come unto me I will in no wise cast out. Well, if you stop right there, then that can quickly lead you to thinking that every single child of God will hear the gospel and respond to it and, uh, and invite the Lord into their heart. Everyone in this room knows that that's not true, but we need to know why. Uh, the, we all know that there are, there are tribes and peoples that have never been exposed to the gospel. But the scriptures tell us that God has a people in every kindred, nation, tongue, and people. And those cannot be excluded. So if you, if you know what the rest of the scriptures say, then you can't take that verse and, and head to such a heresy. Amen? But it also, if you, don't, if you don't think about what you're reading and you only read that one piece, then you're going to quickly give glory to men. And you're going to quickly give uh, the opportunity for man to take a step. All the Father giveth me shall come unto me. So then the idea forms in our mind that, okay, well, I have to do something. I have to come to him. I have to seek him. That's, you hear about seeker-friendly churches a lot these days. Well, uh, if you don't read the rest of the, of the chapter, then it's really easy to think that. But if you go down <laughs> to verse number 44, it says, No man can come unto me except the Father which has sent me draw him. You see, God got there first. <laughs> Amen? He always gets there first. Amen? Say it louder. Amen? He always gets there first. God, and that word draw, now you've, you've been taught this for the last 40 years. Uh, the, no man can come to me except the Father which has sent me draw him. That word draw actually means drag. <laughs> I'm talking about get you by the hair of the head and drag you against your will. Oh, yes. Because the natural man receiveth not the things of God for their foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them for they're spiritually discerned. See, God has to get there first. And he has to drag you against your will. Otherwise, you would never come unto him. You see? You see how quickly, how quickly we can mis, uh, draw misconceptions and head towards heresy so quickly if we don't read the whole scripture. Isn't that beautiful, though? Well, what does that mean? That means we have to be diligent and read the whole scripture. <laughs> and we have to know what the word says so we can cross-reference and we remember, oh, what well, that scripture says this, and the scriptures never contradict themselves. Amen? So I just wanted to give you that gentle reminder this morning that reading, reading the scriptures and being studious and knowing what the word of God says is a protection, and it's a comfort, and it's beautiful. Let's pray. 
Father, we thank you so much for preserving your word for us. Thank you for not leaving us in the dark about what you've done for us, for preserving this story, for preserving your instructions for us. We ask that you would give us diligence and that you would give us a fervor for learning the scriptures and sharing them with others and sharing them with each other. We ask that you would bless this time that we have today to, to set aside for worshiping you. We thank you for the for the worship service this morning. We thank you for the opportunity to kneel at your throne and pray to you. And we thank you for this, your servant, that you've given us to preach the word. And we ask that you would bless him abundantly this morning, that you would free his mind and heart from the cares of the world, that you would give him a tongue of utterance, that we might hear the unsearchable riches of you. We ask that you would help us to hide this word in our hearts, Hide the words that are preached to us in our hearts and never forget where our help comes from. Lord, bless us as we go from this place. Bless our time of fellowship and forgive us when we fail you. We are so weak and we need you. Grant us your mercy and grant us, <coughs> grant us your help. And we ask these things in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Amen. I wanted you to turn with me, please, to Psalm 85 this morning. Psalm 85. <clears throat> Appreciate what has gone on before and true. Uh, if you ever, if you're looking through the old Baptist sermons, there's one that, uh, if you can find it, that's spot on with what Brother Jason has brought to us, uh, preached by Sonny Piles way back, maybe in the 80s, and it's called Half Hinges. And, uh, and it speaks to this, this issue of just reading part of a scripture and not all of it. If you don't read all of it, then you don't get all the context uh, or all what he's meaning. You can take any verse in the Bible and teach kind of any, almost any kind of doctrine that you want to. Um, but if you read all of it in context, it is a statement of the truth of the living God, and God's people will profit from it and rejoice in it. Uh, the text that we want to read to you is in the 10th verse, uh, that verse 10 and verse 11. And to be very honest with you, I don't know if I'll be able to preach on this or not. Uh, only God knows this morning. That may seem strange to some people, uh, but I, I'm one that firmly believes that uh, unless the Lord guides the preaching, there'll be no preaching. And um, uh, I, and if I've ever this is this is a text that I never have preached on solely. Uh, I have used this text in proof texts way back in the uh, 80s and maybe even 90s. But as far as taking this text for uh, a major um, a message, I have not. So I need your prayers. Would you please pray? Yes, yes please pray this morning. Uh, verse 10 and 11. Mercy and truth are met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. Truth shall spring out of the earth and righteousness shall look down from heaven. Yea, the Lord shall give that which is good. Amen. Our land shall yield her increase. Righteousness shall go before him and shall set us in the way of his steps. <clears throat> now, when he starts talking about in terms of him and his steps, he's speaking prophetically. About Now David is not talking about himself and he's not talking about Korah who he is writing uh, regarding in this particular psalm 
but he is speaking prophetically about the Messiah. He's speaking prophetically about the Lord Jesus Christ. In the book of First John, uh, chapter 5, there's a text that says that um, um, there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father and the Word and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. He is, in, and he speaks of the, uh, the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ the word was made flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory as of the only begotten father full of grace and truth. The Lord Jesus Christ is full of grace and truth. Now it says in this text, mercy and truth are met together. And that's, a, that's marvelous in its, if you think about it from the standpoint, if I can get out what I'm thinking right now, it'll be good, okay? <laughs> if I can get it out. <clears throat> but you know, truth, the truth of God's word is, is there's not a living soul that deserves heaven. You say, wait a minute, Brother Steve, I thought I'd done what it took to make it. Let me tell you. If it's left up to that, none of us will make it. Salvation's not by works, it's by grace. Amen? Amen? So truth, the truth is, is that God is right and God is righteous. He's altogether good. There's no error in him. There's no bad in him. There's no evil in him. And that when, when we look at God and compare ourselves to God, we're nothing, even less than nothing. Now, we need to do that occasionally. You know, we're, these, the, the sermons that only try to, try to uh, hype up the, the congregation and, and to get them feeling good about themselves, is, it's not the whole gospel. If we're living in sin and we're living in rebellion against God, we need to feel bad about it to the point where we repent of our sins, right? So when we talk about truth compared to us, we fall very short. And then when we think about, about truth, we think about the commandments of God. I shall have no other gods before me. You know, honor thy father and thy mother. Keep the Sabbath, keep it holy. And those commandments that are so familiar to us and we see on very various places posted. And that's a, in essence, the truth. It's not, it doesn't contain the entire truth of God, but it's the essence of the truth of what God is all about. And his expectation for us as his children to live our lives. He expects us to make the effort to pattern our lives according to his truth. Now, I can look at you right now and I can probably tell that there are us. And I'm going to, if I had a mirror, I'd look at myself, realize how short that I fall in this regard. And just when you get where you think you're doing okay, you mess up. Amen? Yes. I can tell by your amens, you're with me. Yes. So truth is hard for fallen people to follow. Now it's harder for those that are not God's elect. They can't follow it. Remember the, uh, the text that Brother Jason brought to our attention. This, the, uh, the Spirit of God is what gives us the ability to even keep the Word of God as much as we do. When we're born of the Spirit of God, 
we are able to keep his law uh, as best we can and we ought to but we can never keep the law of God to the point where we're going to make ourselves okay with God <clears throat> the Bible tells us over in the book of Romans chapter 3 we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God I've fought in tournaments before and and fought all the way up to the last person I thought I was going to be the victorious uh, victorious fighter and uh, and then I met a big old marine that whooped my tail I fell short of the number one trophy that year and uh, I fell short I mean, I, could, I had it inside. I knew what it looked like, but it didn't make it. And I want you to understand that that's the way we are when it comes to our proficiency in keeping God's law. Now, it does not give us an excuse for not attempting to keep God's law. We are told to do so. When it says thou shall, that means thou shall keep them. From this generation and forever. So we're responsible to God. But I am thankful that there is an essence of truth. When he says mercy and truth are met together. Is that the truth demands perfection. And now we've got something different. We have the personification of mercy meeting together with truth. You know who the personification of mercy is? The only begotten Son of God full of grace and truth. We have somebody that's full of grace and full of truth. He's holy, undefiled, separate from sinners that came to this earth, full of grace. You say, Brother Steve, I just don't have enough grace to forgive. Well, you better be getting some because God... God forgives your sins on the basis of your forgiveness of others. You remember that, don't you? Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Forgive our debts as we forgive our debtors. And we need to be busy about forgiveness. But that's another subject. You see, mercy is Jesus personified, isn't it? God full of grace and truth. Grace is, mercy is a grace. You know what it is, you know the definition? Undeserved pity. Sinners lost and ruined and undone. There's none good. No, not one. There's none that understand it. There's none that seeketh after God. They're all gone out of the way. They're together become unprofitable. There's none that doeth good. No, not one. The poison of asp is under their lips and the way of peace they have not known. There's no fear of God before their eyes. That's us by nature. And that's why we're inappropriate to obtain salvation on our own. But God had mercy. And mercy was born of a Jewish version over 2,000 years ago. Mercy, the personification of mercy. He says mercy and truth have met together. 
And when Christ met truth, he kept it to a jot and to a tittle. And then he says, and truth shall spring out of the earth. Notice that. That's, that's the psalmist David saying something that's also repeated in, in Isaiah chapter 53. Go with me, please, if you will. Isaiah chapter 53, verse 1. Who hath believed our report, and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? I want to give this illustration real quick about that first verse. Who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? When he speaks of the arm of the Lord, he's speaking of the person of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> you know, this is the arm of Steve Wilkinson. It does my bidding, you know, mostly this. Well, it's true. I just have to say it, you know. <clears throat> but it, and, and when I was a carpenter, it was this, driving nails. When I was painting, it was doing this. But it did what I needed to get done to make a living, you know. And when he speaks of the arm of the Lord, of Jehovah, he's speaking of the one that came to this world, into this world, to accomplish what sinners couldn't accomplish. He came at the appropriate time. In the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law. We were all under the law of sin and death. Because of sin, we had the penalty of death, eternal death. But Jesus Christ came into the world, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem them, to buy back them that were under the law. You were under the curse of the law of sin and death, and Christ bought you back from sin and death. Glorious, isn't it? How can't we shout over that, my friends? It's so glorious. And he says, and, and, and Jesus did that. That's his arm. The arm of the Lord. To whom of the arm of the Lord? Or to who is Christ revealed? And he says, for he, the arm of the Lord. Notice, it's in a personal pronoun. He, the arm of the Lord, is a he. He shall grow up before him. Before God. As a tender plant. He was born as a baby in a manger in Bethlehem so many years ago. Came up as a tender plant, as a root out of dry ground. What's that mean? In religion, friends, it was dry. Have you ever been to church when it's dry? I hope you don't say that about Bethany, I'm looking at you now. <laughs> but I've been to, I've been involved in religion before that was dry as it could be. There was no spirit. It was just going through the process, going through the motions of doing it, and no spirit and no lifting of our, our the spirit that is within us to a higher plane than we are normally, you know. And so religion, when Christ was born, was dry. There had been 400 years that God had not spoke to Israel. From Malachi to the birth of Christ, God hadn't said a word to Israel. And friends, religion was dry and boring and mundane and all kinds of errors crept in to the Jewish religion because people started taking liberties with God's word. <clears throat> and so when Christ came, it even hardly resembled the law that Mo Moses gave children of Israel on Mount Sinai. It hardly resembled it. It was so bad. 
And I'll tell you, that'll happen to us. If we don't have the Spirit of God leading us, I'm not saying just me. If you lead us, us in the right way, then we'll stay on track and God will bless and we'll still be the church that God called. And we'll still be the church that's the bride of Christ. But we have to stay faithful. And we have to stay spiritual. And we have to stay lively. And when I say amen, you say amen. amen. <laughs> I was kidding about that one, but I appreciate the great amen. But notice, please. He came up as a tender plant, as a root out of dry ground. Now, doesn't that make sense now? A root is the beginnings of the plant, and it came up out of a dry ground. It was a miracle. Guess what Jesus' birth was? It was a miracle. He was born of a virgin, friends. <clears throat> That's a miracle. That's what happened. A root out of dry ground hath no form or comeliness. And when we shall see him, there's no beauty that we should desire him. If you walk down the street and pass Jesus on the street, you might not even catch, he might not even catch your attention as far as his appearance was concerned. And no, he, didn't, he didn't have the Elvis look, if you think that's pretty. I'm talking about with the sideburns and all, you know. <clears throat> If you think that's pretty. He didn't have the Elvis look. And if anybody else you can think of that's pretty <clears throat> in Hollywood, he didn't have that look either. He just looked like an average Jew. No calmness or beauty. We were not drawn to him. And his disciples were not drawn to him. And you are not drawn to him based upon a portrait that somebody drew. <clears throat> You're drawn to him because of the essence of who he is. He's our Lord and Christ and our Savior. That's why we're drawn to him. And we see him by an eye of faith. And he's lovely and he's beautiful and he's marvelous, isn't he? That's why we're drawn to him. So, when it gets over to verse 10. <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> Yet, in all the things that were described before, it was as a lamb led to the slaughter, like a sheep led to the slaughter, yet he opened not his mouth. And all the wonderful, merciful things that he did, yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. Now, I want you to know that that's different <clears throat> than the bruising of the Roman soldiers. He was definitely bruised. Amen? Yeah. Torn to pieces, his back was. Laid open, bloody, bleeding. The life pouring out of him, friends. But I want to make this little caveat. With all they did to him, they couldn't kill him. You know that? He said, no man taketh my life from me. I have the power to lay it down. I have power to take it up again. No man taketh my life from me. And when he finished the work that he came to do, he yielded up the ghost. The Bible says it in those terms. Yielded up the ghost when he did what was necessary. Jesus knew exactly what it took to save our poor benighted souls to heaven. And he did it, my friends. And when he did, he gave up the ghost. <clears throat> and just before he did, guess what he said? It is finished. Aren't you glad? <clears throat> please the Lord to bruise him the bruising of the Lord was much worse than the bruising of men made him to cry out 
Psalm 22 verse 1. He cried out, Psalm 22 verse 1. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? To hearken back and to show them I am what's described in Psalm 22. I am the fulfillment of Psalm 22. And that, that's a... <clears throat> That's a remez, if you will, from, a teach, from the teacher of teachers to let them know I am the one that Psalm 22 is talking about. And all of this is a fulfillment of that. And he says, <clears throat> he hath put him to grief. That's what, that's what that means. He put him to grief. When thou shall make his soul... An offering for sin. Now listen. The mistake that modern religion makes. I'm going to tell you. Is that they try to add something to what he just said. Yes. Thou shall make his soul an offering for sin. It's not his soul and your agreement with it. It's his soul. Yes. It was enough. And you know why I know? Because he rose from the dead to demonstrate <coughs> that he was the Messiah that was there to save and did save. And if he hadn't accomplished what he came to accomplish, there'd have been no reason for a resurrection. Because he had failed to do what the Messiah was coming to do. <clears throat> when thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. That's you. When Christ was on the cross of Calvary, he had you in mind. Like the high priest who went behind the veil, he had upon a, a mitre on his head that 12 stones with the names of the 12 tribes of Israel on his mitre. <clears throat> and a breastplate on that had the names of the 12 tribes of Israel on his breastplate. <clears throat> he went back there was re representing the 12 tribes of Israel under the law of service. But guess what? That is a type of something way even greater. Because when Christ, he shall see his seed, he had us in mind. The reason when they said come down from the cross that he didn't come down from the cross <clears throat> is because he had you in mind and me in mind I trust. He was there to save us and he would not fail or be discouraged in the accomplishment of that. Aren't you glad? He shall see his seed and prolong his days. And notice this, the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. What's God's pleasure? I came down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me. This is the will of the Father which has sent me, that of all he had given me, I should lose nothing, but raise it up again at the last day. That's God's pleasure. And his pleasure was fulfilled in Christ. <clears throat> the pleasure of the Lord prospered in his hand. He was there to do his father's will. He did the father's will. And in doing the father's will, he saved every heir of promise who will ever live in heaven, friends. And it is a done deal. Aren't you glad? <clears throat> friends, I just rejoice in this. That is the ultimate act of mercy. He took on him what should have come upon us. He suffered what we should suffer throughout all eternity because of our sins and our stubbornness. But God saw to it through his son that the pleasure of the Lord 
prospered in his hand. Then it says in verse 11, <coughs> he shall see the travail of his soul. And say, now there's one more thing for you to do. Well, we better leave a little bit for the sinner to do. Thank the Lord he didn't say that. He shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. And do you know why we know he was satisfied? Because he rose from the dead. And that was the authentication that he was the true, real Messiah and that everything that he came to save was saved because he rose him from the dead. <clears throat> he shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. And by his knowledge, truth, shall my righteous servant justify or declare righteous many. For he shall bear their iniquities. How much more plain can we get, my friends? Mercy and truth met together in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Would you agree with me? Now, just to show you an example of something, if you go with me to the book of John, Brother Jason was in John for, for a moment. We'll go over there for a moment as well. John chapter 5. <clears throat> and to, to show you that mercy and truth met together, I'd like you to look at this text with us and we'll close with this Lord willing after that there was a, a feast of the Jews and Jesus went up to Jerusalem now there is at Jerusalem a, a by the sheep market a pool called in the Hebrew tongue Bethesda having five porches <clears throat> in these lay a great multitude of impotent folk, <clears throat> of blind, halt, withered, waiting for the moving of the water. And the angel went down, an angel, for an angel went down in a certain season into this pool and troubled the water. And whosoever first, <clears throat> after the troubling of the water, stepped in was made whole, whatever disease. <clears throat> that he had. Verse 5. And a certain man was there and which had an infirmity 38 years. Now think about that. Hold are you, Brother Blake? Just above 38, right? He had been afflicted almost as old as you are. 38 years years <clears throat> when Jesus saw him lie Jesus was busy amen guarantee you he was busy but he was the epitome of mercy I, I just it just popped into my head <clears throat> they were, they, were tra they were traveling north and Jesus said I must go through Samaria I must go through Samaria. And I, I know that was strange to the apostles because nobody went through Samaria. They went around Samaria because they were just dogs. <clears throat> they were not real people, you know. They were a mixed breed of people. And, and they had set up their worship in the mountains of Samaria. And, <clears throat> and Jews just didn't have anything to do with the Samaritans. And in fact, the little lady that he met said that. We know that the Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. But guess what? This little child of God, Jesus, knew about her. And he traveled up to Sychar, to the well, and met her. <clears throat> and, and she was not the best person in the world, 
thou hast had five husbands and the one you have right now is not your husband. <clears throat> She's not had the most successful life <clears throat> as far as that goes. <clears throat> and people would have probably shunned her. And she was in the middle of the day getting the water instead of the morning where most women went and gathered water was in the morning in the cool of the day. She was there at noontime avoiding the crowds because of the ridicule possibly that she was under because of her lifestyle previously. But Jesus had mercy on her and traveled all the way up to Sychar and revealed himself as the Messiah. I that speak unto thee am he. Would you say that's mercy? Would you say God will never have mercy upon me? I've been so bad. I'm telling you friends. The Lord is full of mercy and grace. And there's, you've never gone so far. That God's not able to reach you. Amen. Oh yeah. We were in chapter 5 of John. <laughs> well. He'd been that way 38 years. And when Jesus saw him lie. And knew he had been now in that. Uh, for a long time. In such a case. Or <clears throat> in that case. He saith unto him. Will thou be made whole? <coughs> and notice the, the impotent man's response. Sir, I have no man. And I tell you, when I read this, it is pitiful. Is it pitiful to you? Oh my goodness, 38 years. And he says, sir, I have no man. And the water's troubled. To put me into the pool. But while I'm coming, he's trying to get there. Maybe trying to claw and move with his hands to get there. And another step is down before me. Poor guy. Depending upon a troubled water. But guess what? He met up with the personification of mercy. You'd have thought somebody would have said... You know what? Let's help this poor guy. He's been here so long. He's been trying so hard to get into the pool. This, this time, let's help him get into the pool. Not a soul had mercy upon him. <clears throat> Except he that is full of mercy. There's not a soul who can help you. But he that is full of mercy. If you need help. You need Christ. Yes. I love the way you nod brother Harold. I tell you I just love it. I love it. Absolutely. And so. What he does is say this. Rise up. Take thy bed and walk. Mercy and truth yeah. met together in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Rise up, take thy bed and walk. Guess what happened? Yeah. <laughs> he rose up and walked. It was the truth, wasn't it? And immediately the man was made whole and took his bed and walked and on the same day was the Sabbath day. And all that happened was they criticized him for carrying his bed on the Sabbath. If he'd been there 38 years, they'd seen him. They knew he was there. <coughs> And all they can say, there are heartless people in this world, folks. We should not be surprised that there are heartless people in, these world, in this world. But I want you to know the people of God are not heartless, or they should not be. They should be merciful like our Savior is merciful. Right? I love that. 
at Jesus' crucifixion. They were, had treated him unmercifully. Verse 34 of the 23rd chapter of Luke. You know what Jesus said? Lord, send down lightning bolts and get these people for what they've done to me. Thank you. I love the way the sister responds right here. I love that. He didn't say that, did he? He said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And the next time maybe somebody has done something and you, you think somebody has done something to you and you're all mad and upset about it, you might consider the fact that they didn't even know that they did anything wrong and you might ought to consider forgiving them for they might not even have known what they've done. Amen? Thank you. That is the truth. And so he is a God of mercy. As he was hanging there, he was undeserving of his punishment. Right? Sinless, undefiled, separate from sinners. Men on either side of him, fully, fully deserving. Committed murder and treason. <clears throat> and <clears throat> one of the malefactors, and by the way, they were both reviling Jesus just moments before. This tells you how quick you can be born again. I mean, you can be born again. Quick. You're talking about light speed, you know, on Star Trek and all that. We're talking light speed, folks. <clears throat> you can be born again now, right? And it says in verse 39, one of the malefactors, which hang railed on him, if I be the Christ, save thyself and us. But the other one, they were, both, they were both just moments before railing on him and now but the other one answered rebuked him saying dost thou not fear God Say, uh, saying dost thou not fear God seeing that thou art uh, this, in, under the same condemnation and we indeed justly for we receive the due reward of our deeds but this man had done nothing amiss. What happened to this guy? I mean, they're both railing on him and then all of a sudden he recognizes that he's a sinner and recognizing there's nothing wrong with the Son of God. I'd say he's been born again right now. What do you think? In the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, it happens according to Galatians chapter 1. When it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace. It happens when it pleases God and it pleased God to bring this malefactor hanging on the cross and dying beside him. To bring him to life in Christ Jesus on the cross. And guess what he says. And he said to Jesus. Lord did you hear that you can't call Jesus Lord except by the Holy Spirit right Lord remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom guess what he says y'all know it don't you y'all quote it easy as I can can I read it for you verily I say unto thee today not a thousand years from now. Not a day later. Today. Shall thou be with me. In paradise. Paradise. Is the place where Paul was lifted up to. And saw unspeakable things that. He could not speak. He was lifted up to the third heaven himself. And he's telling this thief. Today you're going to be with me. In heaven's pure world. That's mercy. That as that man lay anguishing. 
and dying on the cross and his mouth, his life bleeding out of him. He now has the truth. And it would you say this is the epitome of dying grace? <laughs> We've talked about dying grace. You know, sometimes we're fearful of death, but the Lord gives us grace when we approach that time and allows us to take that step from this life into the next life, doesn't he? And imagine the peace that probably felt the heart of this dying thief as he breathed out his last. And then his eyes opened in the presence of God and in the presence of the one that was hanging on the other cross beside him. That's mercy, folks. Mercy and truth have met together in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. Thy righteous servant shall justify many. Righteousness and peace. Paul said in, in Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10, I think it is, he hath made peace through the blood of his cross. I'm telling you, my friends, what a joy it is. Righteousness. Let me, let me read the whole text again. <coughs> Yea, truth shall spring out of the earth and righteousness shall look down from heaven. God saw all that was done and was satisfied with what was done. And if God's satisfied, I'm satisfied. Amen? Amen. There's a song that says, I'd rather have Jesus. Amen. Amen. Than silver or gold. If I don't have very much of this world's goods, that's okay. But let me have him to be my companion while I live. And when nobody else wants to have mercy on me, I know he will. And I pray that God will give you grace to rejoice in this text like I've rejoiced in it this morning. Go read it. Read that whole 85th Psalm. It's awesome. It's an awesome Psalm. <coughs> and may God bless you is my prayer. Thank you for your patient attention this morning. There might be somebody who would like to follow the Lord Jesus Christ and be a member of his church. And if you do, you come while we sing this song. Let's just sing that 335. 335. <coughs> uh, we'll sing this song. The church will wait upon you, hear your statement to the church. And then uh, immediately following the... Uh, I tell you what we're, we're going to do. We're going to dispense with a handshake for now. We're going to sing this song, close the service, and then we're going to dismiss briefly, and then we're going to meet back together. Don't go anywhere. Because Asha's ah, got to come up here, and she's not, don't got to come up here. She's going to come up here, and the Lord willing, we're going to perform the ordinance of baptism. <clears throat> and we will make room for whoever wants to come be baptized with her. Amen? 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 Let's stand and sing. If you want to follow the Lord and become a member of this church, you come and do that while we sing. <coughs> 335.
everyone be seated. We're going to, as they're preparing, we're going to continue singing. Uh, William, will you come and help um, move the pulpit, please?
and our life and service to the Lord Jesus Christ is, is a testimony of our belief in Him and our desire to do what He did. When John went, when the Lord went to John the Baptist for baptism, John did not feel worthy to baptize the Lord because he just referred to him as the Lamb of God and take away the sin of the world. I mean, that would make him wow. He needs to be baptized in me, which is what John said. I have need to be baptized in thee. And that comes to me. He said, suffer it or allow it to be suffered. For thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. That Jesus, in every aspect of righteousness, fulfilled it for us. We've already discussed that this morning. He did everything that was necessary. But that also states that baptism is the right, is the right thing to do. It's a righteous act. It's the right thing to do. We love Jesus Christ. We believe that he's our Savior. Is to take our cross up and follow him in baptism. And baptism, according to Romans 6, is a picture of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ himself. It is a, when we baptize, we're testifying that we believe in the death, burial, and resurrection. That whole process is a picture of Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. And we fulfill that when we take our cross up and follow the Lord Jesus Christ. Isn't that glorious to think about? And, and it's a testimony to the church that we believe in his death, burial, and resurrection. It's a testimony to the uh, to, to the church, it's a testimony to the world that we believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's a testimony to the Lord Himself that I believe in you. I believe in your death, burial, and resurrection. In all those aspects, we're bearing testimony of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Isn't that glorious that when we do that? It's not just something that we do to get wet to get so we can get to become a member of the church. That's not what it is. It is a real ceremony of bringing together the child of God with the bride of Christ. We're thankful for that. <coughs> the Lord's gift. Would you pray with me? Righteous and ever be his Lord, Heavenly Father. We come to you now. In this time of rejoicing, thank you, Lord, for your many and rich blessings. To thank you, Lord, for the church that you give us, your bride. And we pray, and we're, we're thankful, Lord, that you have filled it with your people that love you and want to follow you. We're thankful for dear sister Asha that has come forward asking for a home in this church and desiring to follow you in this way. We do pray, Lord, that you bless her life, that you lead her by your unerring spirit through her life, show her the paths of righteousness for your name's sake, show her that which is good in life, and that which is good and godly and lovely in your sight. We ask that you call upon, through your spirit, the members of this church to rally around her and to be at her feet and to serve her. Bless her to be a servant to others. May we all be knit together as one family here at Bethany Church to your glory and to your honor. We pray in Jesus' name for his sake. And amen. amen. All right. Now,
take your cross up and follow him. We yes. now, amen. Oh, sorry. <laughs> we now, amen. See, she still believes it, right? I now baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Ghost. Amen.
you're the sweetest candidate I've done lately. <laughs> what a day, huh? Amen. Just think about what a day it's going to be when we have our big reunion Amen. in the glory world. Amen? On resurrection morning. What a glorious day it will be, right? That's what the song says. Have announcements? Brother <coughs> Larry? I have some prayer requests too. Okay. Come on up if you want. I understand that uh, Sister Chrissy is going to be in Atlanta next Sunday. Uh, Sunday. 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 They're going to do a C-section if they can't get the baby to turn. Yeah. Okay. So please keep her in your prayers. And please pray that Silas will turn around. <laughs> Is that the name? Yes. Silas? Silas. Oh, I love it. Like Paul and Silas. Amen. So keep Sister Crystal in prayer. And Sister Ashley has a biopsy tomorrow. So keep her in your prayers. Okay. Oh. It's a good spanking stick, though. It really is. Yes, and we have communion next Saturday evening at 6 p.m. Also, that weekend is the Luling meeting, right? Yeah. And who are they having as their visit? Daryl Chambers. Daryl Chambers. Daryl. Bill, He's Bill, from North Bill. Alabama. Yeah. So uh, keep that in mind if you have a chance. If you have permission to go over there as long as you make it back here by 6 o'clock. Any other announcements? I can't think of anything. This is Susan over here. Sister Susan? Mm -hmm. Susan? Yes. Uh, Y'all have praying for my girlfriend, Rochelle in Colorado. She had a stroke last August, and she was <coughs> starting to regain some mobility in her right hand. And she was right handed, so it's a very big deal for her. So I appreciate the prayers. Um, my friend Micah that's been having seizures and had the implant and the seizures went away has started having some breakthrough seizures again that are pretty intense. So keep praying for him. And then today is my youngest son's birthday. He's under the ocean somewhere. So I thought we'd just say a little extra prayer for that. I wish he was here so we could sing happy birthday. <laughs> just dismiss him, and he's been on my mind a lot lately. So, we all just pray for him some more. Yes, sir. Is that it? <clears throat> Brother Blake, will you dismiss us by prayer, please? Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day, Lord. Thank you for the message that's gone before us this morning. Lord, thank you for this church. Thank you for all of us that make up this church. And thank you for our newest member here, Lord. We ask that you be with each and every one of us, all those that were mentioned just now and all those that are on our prayer list, dear Lord, you know the, the needs of all of us, and whether they've been spoken or not, dear Lord, we ask that you do that will and be with each and every one of us. Mm -hmm. Keep us keep us close to you, dear Lord. Yes. Dear Lord, as we go now and 
this hour of fellowship. We ask that you bless that time of fellowship together. 